today inside the gym that trains ninja warriors. We've got the best training facility in the country. Then, how this woman shed 100 pounds and a lifetime of shame. And the authentic Martha was finally blooming. Plus, a sheriff investigates a crash. It wouldn't be surprising if it was a fatal. And finds an answer he didn't expect. I guess I was looking for something that was missing. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. Well, the president is at it again. He's coming forth with a rather radical but impressive immigration policy. It's long overdue that we would have a reform of our immigration. And what he wants to do is to make sure that the immigrants can speak English and uh, have some sort of skill and perhaps a little bit of an IQ. Well. The left is already screaming, it's un-American to demand that people can speak English. Let's take them in from anywhere. Well, why is that? Well, because if they can't read and write, then maybe they'll vote Democratic. That's the idea. But Trump is saying, no, I want an educated immigration group. And well, we'll see. The fight is on, among other things. But they should assimilate, don't you think? Well, of course they yes. should. Yeah, we ought to speak English, too. We shouldn't be having the idea that you've got 50 different languages. You know, they, they use the term polyglot, and uh, we English is important to understand our laws and our culture, and whoever is here should be immersed in English so that they can get ahead in our society. And it would be for their benefit that we make sure we teach English. Absolutely. Very important. Right. Well, and Republicans in the Senate are making it clear again, it may take a while, but they still aren't giving up on dealing with Obamacare. Jenna Browder brings us that story from Washington. President Trump is making good on campaign promises. When it comes to immigration, he's endorsing a new plan that aims to overhaul the current system. This legislation demonstrates our compassion for struggling American families who deserve an immigration system that puts their needs first and that puts America first. Standing with Senators Tom Cotton and David Perdue, Trump pushed their bill to slash legal immigration in half. The measure would put skilled workers and English speakers at the front of the line and limit admissions based on family connections. Over 50 percent of our households of legal immigrants today participate in our social welfare system. The legislation was first introduced in February but didn't get much traction. And now already some fellow Republicans are speaking out against it. This idea of skewing the entire green card pool to one area of the economy I think is very misplaced. Senator Lindsey Graham says he supports merit-based immigration, but worries about the legislation's impact on agriculture, tourism, and service industries. Democrats call it an affront to American values and a threat to the U.S. economy. And White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders appeared on CBN's Faith Nation, where she talked about the president signing a new bill on sanctions with Russia, North Korea, and Iran, despite calling it seriously flawed and something that limits his ability to negotiate. We have been very clear since the beginning that this administration is going to be tough on Russia, tough on North Korea, tough on Iran, and certainly wanted to be supportive of those sanctions, but also wanted to do so uh, properly. At the same time, time, Republicans are pushing ahead with plans for tax cuts, and some senators are taking a different approach on health care reform. Days after the Republican effort to repeal and replace Obamacare crumpled in the Senate, some lawmakers say they're reaching across the aisle to work together. I think we can resolve those problems, but it's going to take more bipartisan work. We have a lot of bipartisan discussions going on right now more than we've had in months. But not all Republicans think they'll be able to reach a deal with Democrats. And President Trump says he's not giving up either. But if the effort fails again, he says Obamacare will have to run its course. Let Obamacare explode. It is exploding right now. You know, I said from the beginning, let Obamacare implode and then do it. President Trump is looking for wins wherever they may be. That's why he's moving forward on immigration and tax reform while still holding out for health care. Reporting in Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. You know, I think the idea of providing subsidies, and that's what the Democrats want. They want subsidies to bolster up Obamacare, which is failing. 
And so we would be shoveling out tax money. And one federal judge has already said it's unconstitutional because the Congress hasn't really appropriated it. And yet the Obama administration did it anyhow. They shoveled out money. And uh, uh, that uh, district court uh, decision went to the D.C. Circuit, and they're pending a uh, decision on it. If it hits the Supreme Court, I think the Supreme Court would go along with the, the district court judge. But the whole idea of, of, of a under-the-table subsidy to keep those exchanges going uh, is, is wrong. It's unconstitutional. It wasn't, it wasn't in the original bill, as bad as that bill was. And President Trump should not cave in on that one. He ought to hold fast and say, no way are we going to give subsidies to keep that failing stuff al alive. And we talked yesterday about the subsidies being given to members of Congress and their staffs, a 73% subsidy of their premiums that's coming out of taxpayer dollars out of your pocket so that they can have what you don't have and they can have a Cadillac type uh, health care program paid for by the government. And the way they did it was again, uh, sleight of hand by declaring that the Senate and the House of Representatives are, quote, small businesses, and that they could for apply to the exchanges in the District of Columbia where employers can subsidize the health care of their employees if they're small businesses. And that's um, just one of those little sneaky things they've done. Let's not give them any more money, Mr. President. Hold fast. They they will sucker you in and hurt you. Don't let them do that. Well, the president and the country got some good news yesterday. The Dow Jones closed above 22,000 for the first time in its history. And many analysts think the market will keep going higher. President Trump is also uh, a major a uh, foreign policy crisis to deal with, a growing nuclear threat from North Korea. And Wendy has that. That's right, Pat. The U.S. military put North Korea on notice Wednesday when it successfully test launched an intercontinental ballistic missile from California. The launch came just days after North Korea's second test of an ICBM, one that could have proved deadly. CBN's national security correspondent Eric Rosales has the story. Early Wednesday morning, the United States sent a strong message to North Korea and its leader, Kim Jong-un. An unarmed Minuteman III missile was launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base about 130 miles northwest of Los Angeles. An Air Force statement said that the test was not in response to the recent actions by North Korea, but shows that America's nuclear enterprise is, quote, safe, secure, effective, and ready to be able to deter, detect, and defend against attacks on the United States and its allies. Last week, North Korea tested an ICBM for the second time. The missile flew for 45 minutes and traveled more than 2,300 miles into space. Analysts said the missile could have reached cities like Los Angeles and Chicago. In a disturbing development, the missile came down right in the middle of busy commercial airspace. Flight data shows an Air France 777 jetliner with 323 people on board was traveling from Tokyo to Paris and past the area. Ten minutes later, the North Korean missile came down on the plane's direct flight path. The crew of this plane had no idea that they were in danger because the missile was coming in from outer space. And what if this missile had broken up at altitude and scattered pieces all around? It would have made it even more dangerous. The Pentagon has said North Korea's missile launches are done with no coordination and are reckless. Meanwhile, the United States, through the State Department, has taken a softer approach with North Korea telling the cloaked country and its leader that the United States is not your enemy. We do not seek a regime change. We do not seek the collapse of the regime. We do not seek an accelerated reunification of the peninsula. We do not seek an excuse <clears throat> to send our military north of the 38th parallel. However, in the same breath, Secretary Tillerson said the United States still requires North Korea to end its missile and nuclear program. And although he said the U.S. seeks dialogue with the North, he added that, quote, our other options are not attractive. Later this week, Secretary Tillerson plans to head to Asia for a security meeting. It's expected to be attended by diplomats from North Korea, Japan, South Korea, and China. It could be an opportune moment for a diplomatic breakthrough. Eric Rosales, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Eric.
Pat, how should we deal with North Korea? Well, you know, John Bolton had a very excellent uh, piece today uh, in the Wall Street Journal and saying essentially, you know, we've got to go after them. I, I don't know what Tillerson's thinking about. I mean, just like that thing in Qatar, he's uh, in Qatar. I mean, he's, he's saying different things than what the president might be saying. We don't see redeem, regime change. Of course we do. We want regime change. We want that bunch of criminals and crazies out of there and somebody responsible to take over that country. And yes, we would like to see reunification between the South and the North. And yes, we may have to have a military option in there. And to say we don't seek it, well, I, I don't know what he's talking about. But the truth is, we need to pinpoint all of their nuclear uh, facilities. We need to pinpoint all of their launch sites. The one way I was talking to the president when I was interviewing him about that, I said, you know, if they, if they have one coming off the launch pad, it's very vulnerable, and that's the time we could uh, shoot it down. And would that be an option? Well, the answer is, of course it is. But I would think Tomahawk missiles against all of those artillery batteries throughout uh, South, uh, North Korea would be an appropriate response. But we've got to be ready along the way to decimate that whole nation because they are holding us hostage. If they get a nuclear-tipped missile that can hit Denver or hit Chicago or hit Los Angeles, and they're crazy enough to let one go. I mean, we're talking about several million of our fellow citizens being incinerated by those people. We can't allow that to happen. And the president is charged with keeping our country safe. And you've got a, a, a rabid dog running around the street biting people. You've got to put him down. Wendy? is reportedly frustrated with his military <laughs> advisors on Afghanistan. NBC reports that Trump said the U.S. is losing in Afghanistan. He said that at a meeting last month. The president hasn't been happy with the options the military has given him either. One of the biggest questions is whether or not to send more troops in. The U.S. has about 8,400 there now. Some advisors want to send several thousand more, while others support a limited U.S. role. The Afghanistan war is the longest in U.S. history, going into its 16th year now, Pat. Wendy, I, I, I just don't see Afghanistan. You know, uh, there have been a number of conquerors, back to Alexander the Great, that have not exactly done successfully in Afghanistan. It's mountainous, it's tribal, it is broken into factions. They make the biggest amount of money selling opium. I mean, it's the kind of thing, I just don't see it as strategic. I think uh, Pakistan, on the other hand, is, and Pakistan ought to get their act together and start behaving themselves. But nevertheless, uh, to put more money and treasure into Afghanistan, uh, I, you say, are well, you gonna win it having won? What have you got? And then you, you know, we don't want to govern Afghanistan. We had that Karzai and some of those cor corrupt people trying to run the country, and it was a joke. And you have tribal leaders, you have the Pashtuns, you have various tribal factions. They fight each other all the time. They kill each other. They've been doing it for centuries. Why do we want to get involved? Russia tried to do it and failed. Why should we do it? And I think the president is saying you're losing the war, yes. And we have been losing the war, and I don't think it's appropriate to go anymore. But that's my point, point of view, and maybe I'm a little too dovish, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Pat, we've had an overwhelming response to a report, report we brought you last week. Sweden wants to deport an Iranian Christian woman, but her newfound faith in Jesus could mean death if she's forced to return. Dale Hurd brings us this update on her situation. Since CBN News first brought you her story, Eideen Stranson's future remains in limbo. She waits either for political asylum or to be deported. The Iranian actress left Islam to become a Christian after having a dream about Jesus. She came to Sweden in 2014 on a work visa. Aydin has been very public about her new faith, which means she faces prison, rape and death if returned to the Islamic Republic of Iran. It's so dangerous for me and um, I don't know why immigration don't believe that. I'm really in a danger. Even though Sweden's Migration Board says on its own webpage that it will never deport asylum seekers to nations where they face danger, and doing so is a violation of the Geneva Convention on Refugees, 
The Migration Board rejected Ideen's request for asylum and turned her case over to border police for eventual deportation. Swedish attorney Gabriel Donner. Well, the Migration Board information regarding uh, Iranian prisoners tells us that uh, torture and rape is common. And it is also in breach of international law to subject any person to such treatment. So many CBN viewers contacted the Migration Board after our story aired that a Migration Board official contacted CBN News and told us, the fact that your readers write to us will not change the Migration Agency's decision, nor can we change the court's decision. Her case has been appealed and processed by the Migration Agency, and thereafter by the Swedish courts, which have also decided that she cannot be granted asylum. CBN News has received many offers of help and even asylum for Ideen from other nations. But Stranson cannot leave Sweden on her own. Her Iranian passport has been taken away. And she says her first choice is to remain in Sweden if possible. Stranson and other Christian asylum seekers in Sweden face deportation at the same time the Swedish government has given 150 protected identities to former ISIS fighters who have returned to Sweden so that they can find jobs. There will be no such help for Aydin. They said to me, uh, it's your personal life and um, it's not uh, a problem if you decided to be a Christian and it's your problem. Donner says Christians deported to Muslim nations face this certain danger. I mean, some of them are killed straight off, some of them succeed in going into hiding, some of them escape to some other place, but you are putting them at risk. The head of Sweden's migration board, Mikael Ribbenvik, could order her case reopened, but Aydin is now relying on a power much greater than the Swedish government, the power of Jesus Christ. I think about the that dream I had in Iran about Jesus uh, and I still think uh, he's uh, watching me, he, he will help me. Dale Heard, CBN News. Dale tells us that he heard from Ideen earlier today. Her attorney is going to try for a new hearing next week and Pat, obviously we need to keep this in well, prayer. I think this is becoming a worldwide scandal for Sweden. Sweden was known during the Nazi era as a haven for people trying to escape the Nazi terror. And uh, uh, you look at uh, Count Bernadotte and people like that who were so well known in the world for their humanitarian activity. And then to see this particular crazy bureaucratic nonsense being uh, carried out is just uh, appalling. It seems like the United States could give that girl a, a, a temporary visa, a green card, in a, in a hurry and, and let her come over here or go someplace else. But there's no question if she goes back to Iran, she'll be raped and killed. There's no question about it. And so to say that uh, there's no danger, there's no terror, I mean, the Swedes are, come on, I mean, get real. And I, I think it's time they do that, but there's a opprobrium coming against that nation from all over the world because of their treatment of this woman. Harry. Well, coming up, it's part gym, part obstacle course, and it's training the next generation of ninja warriors. People are looking for places to belong. They're looking for places to connect. People want you to succeed. And it's not something you really find in culture or in the world today. You'll see how these elite athletes are also using their platform to spread the gospel. That's next. Well, millions of people, some like me, I might add, tune in to watch a show called American Ninja Warriors. The show is now in its ninth season as these athletes perform impossible tasks over incredible obstacles, hoping ultimately to take home one million dollars. As Mark Martin shows, the program has sparked a new fitness craze across the country, training ninjas. It's not your typical workout, from swinging on ropes and maneuvering through rings to supporting yourself with pegs and walking on softballs. Those training to become ninja warriors face a rigorous road. I think gyms uh, like this, gyms like Iron Sports, training for American Ninja Warrior getting so popular because 
It's, it's a different kind of training. It involves a lot of um, calisthenics, which is just body movement. Daniel Gill is one of the students at Houston's American Ninja Warrior Iron Sports Gym. He and the others tackle obstacle courses developed by gym owner Sam Sand. Sand says the intense training works all muscle groups and also develops mental toughness. San also competes on American Ninja Warrior, so he knows what it takes. I, myself, and my staff um, actually take the time to build a different obstacle to actually give people a different type of training, uh, al alternative training versus, you know, the weight room and stuff like that. So it does, uh, we take, I take pride in what we do here as far as, you know, on all the training and all the obstacles that we put. And San has the results to back that up. He says every year, more than 20 people from this gym alone make it on the show. That number includes former Olympic gymnast John Horton, who took home a silver medal on the high bar. I think Houston's probably a hotbed simply because we've got the best training facility in, in the country. You know, Sam San has built just the perfect place to train. Gyms like Iron Sports can be found across the country. It's everybody helping each other versus, you know, in it to win it. And, um, and I think that that's why, you know, bringing, I, I like to invite friends to this place because I just think it's the people, like the way everybody helps each other and really serves each other that way, encourages each other is what, brings me back, what draws me here. Ninja competitor Gianna Manners says it also provides her the opportunity to be a witness for Jesus Christ. I just love like the fact that this is totally a, 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 a podium for, for um, you know, just being able to, to represent the Lord in, in a, in a Christ-like way and being able to draw people. Fellow competitor Grant Clinton agrees. Being a believer, uh, that's what it's all about. Um, really, it's not about me being up there and performing well. Of course, I'm a competitor and I like to do well. I want to compete well, but God's glory uh, is first. The training has provided James Wyatt an avenue to share his Christian faith. It's given me an opportunity uh, to, to start some Bible studies, to really kind of meet people and talk to people about Jesus that I'm, I probably would never meet. And so I'm able to take my faith and, and take how I train people and, and teach people and kind of integrate the two. All these things that are fun and new and exciting are totally of this world and are fleeting, but if it has a purpose and, and it has like a real foundation and a, and a um, you know, a, a way to further the kingdom, it's, it's gonna succeed. God will make it succeed and I feel like this, this culture, this, this, these group of people that are just loving on each other, serving each other, I feel like it's, it's something that will really stick around for a really long time. Adults are not the only ones wanting to become ninjas. Kids are also getting involved, taking part through classes and demonstrations like this one. Are you enjoying the show today? Yeah. Daniel Gill says it makes sense that younger generations want to be ninjas. And so it's really fun for both, you know, parents and kids alike, because kids, I mean, for me, I feel like I'm a kid at heart. Just, we love to climb on things. We love the challenge of, of coming up against something that's, you know, maybe a little bit intimidating or it's balanced or it's, it's upper body and learning how to conquer those obstacles. James Wyatt, a trainer at Iron Sports and Ninja competitor, says he and his wife were looking for something to do with their kids and the gym was a good fit. He believes while the show has helped make these gyms popular, there's more to why people are drawn here. But I think they stick around mainly because of the community, right? People are looking for places to belong. They're looking for places to connect. And the ninja community, the, the obstacle course community is a very, um, it's, a gr it's a great group of people. Um, they're very friendly, they're very helpful. You know, people want you to succeed. Um, and it's not something you really find in culture and the world today. Mark Martin, CBN News. Well, I think I'll pass on that, but uh, <laughs> I was asking our guys, you know, ninja uh, was a skilled warrior and there's special people with sword fighting in the Japanese culture in the old Meiji uh, dynasty. And, um, you know, they have all those spooky films with those dead ninjas <laughs> in black coming out, you yes. know, to kill people. And now you've got a competition, and man, it is tough. Well, so impressive. Yeah, I, I don't exactly see it as a vehicle for the gospel, but that's uh, that's their. I guess you can Christianize anything. God works in mysterious ways. Plenty <laughs> mysterious. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, up next, she's a fitness and a nutrition coach, and she was her own first client. I vividly remember thinking, you are 40 years old. This has to stop. I'm a mom to seven kids now, and I fell flat on my face. See how she slimmed down from 250 pounds.
after this. It's like this is Fitness Thursday, I'm telling you. <laughs> and before we go from Menjus to one of our own, a, a person who actually works at our affiliate relations here at CBN, Martha Van Camp. Now, Martha was a size 20, and she tipped the scales at 250 50. Mm. pounds. 200, that is big. For lunch, she ate Cheez-Its and a diet drink. For dinner, she chugged three beers and swallowed sleeping pills. Then a few years ago, Martha realizes she needed to make some major changes in her life. And today, Martha, all 220 pounds of her, is a size two. I remember what my dad weighed, and I think at the time it was like 194 and 195, and I just wanted to weigh less than him. I don't think that ever happened in my adult life. Never. Growing up, I was taller than most of the boys in school, which meant I got teased. There was one insensitive comment that I let define me for decades. I remember exactly where I was standing in the classroom, and he called me Big Bertha. And I remember being devastated. I interpreted it as, you're not the tallest one in the class, you're the fattest one in the class. I was brought up in a very loving Christian family, but it never occurred to me that God could help. Prayed and I did what all good Christian girls do. Your parents teach you the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, you know. But I didn't have a relationship with the Lord. Um, nor in that naive state thought he could fix this. I battled my weight through high school and college and tried everything to fix it. But no diet, pill, gimmick, or even plastic surgery fixed the problem. I probably thought I was unlovable. Not necessarily to God, but to man. And having that thought in the back of my head is probably what led me down the road to my first marriage. Hindsight, I see how the Lord was trying to stop that marriage. Oh no, I got this. I can make this marriage work. I can fix him. I can fix me. But in time, it became clear that I couldn't fix it and I just felt like a complete failure as a person. I was married, had the twins, had Carter, my youngest, but my marriage was dead. I kept up a good front, but in my early 30s, the bottom just fell out of my life. I lost my very high paying executive job because of a buyout. I lost my marriage and then my dad horrifically, tragically died. And in that time, I had nothing else to hold on to other than this God I had believed in for 30 years. The deeper need was a true relationship with the Lord, completely. I spent time developing that relationship like never before. I said, okay, you are real. And I want to live the rest of my life feeling you and hearing you. And so that was, that was a line in the sand. You're in control, take over. He graciously proved that he could take whatever mess I had put myself into and provide a way out. And all I needed to do was just ask for help. Several years later, I met and married Stephen, a government contractor with four kids. I was growing greatly in my faith, but the struggle with my weight was far from over. I'm a mom to seven kids now and I fell flat on my face. And so I shut down. I would go to work during the day. I would come home to a house that had literally been trashed by seven children. And to be honest, my dinner consisted of either a bottle of wine or four beers. So it happened gradually and I blew up to 250 pounds. I was undone and I finally asked God to help me get healthy. 
I vividly remember thinking, you are 40 years old. This has to stop. I pulled back on the alcohol. I still didn't know how to fuel my body. I didn't know what foods to eat. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, what do you do now, Martha? Are you gonna trust me now? And I just, again, had this sixth sense that he was going to point me in some direction, and he did. My first step was to join a gym and start exercising. Next, I read everything I could find on nutrition. In the first 10 months, I lost 50 pounds. I got the discipline from the Lord because I had never had the discipline before. And as I was getting smaller on the outside, I was growing stronger on the inside. I became a better mother. Your confidence goes up. Your outlook on life goes up. And the authentic Martha was finally blooming. I eventually opened my own gym, lost a hundred pounds, and became a fitness and nutrition coach. Now my greatest joy is leading others to find their help in God too. Stop ignoring Him and thinking you can fix everything on yourself. He is a God who will take your biggest mess. He will take your mess and turn it into the most beautiful, beautiful story. What a magnificent story. What an amazing girl. And it's true about yeah. everything in our lives. God wants to take our mess and do something sure. incredible That's with right. it. Unbelievable. Sure did for Martha's. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Great, Martha, congrats. Well, for more information on Martha Van Camp's national health, wellness, and coaching services, all you have to do is go to CBN.com. It's all there. Still ahead, it was a life-altering crash, and not because someone died in an accident, but because someone didn't. Her mother looked at me and said, we, we could be planning a funeral right now, and Katie's alive. Hear why that statement caused one cop to question everything he knew. That's next. Welcome back to the 700 Club. A major heat wave is baking the Pacific Northwest. Portland, Oregon hit 100 degrees Wednesday, and it was 90 in Seattle. I'm gonna go jump in a lake. <laughs> Today it's been swamped. We've sold about 130 or 140 pieces of air conditioners, probably sold about 150 fans. Probably this time next week, we will be very close to being out. Well, it's not over yet. The National Weather Service says Seattle could hit 95 degrees today, while Portland could reach 105. Well, a major breakthrough in genetic therapy. Researchers were able to safely repair a disease-causing gene in an embryo. They say that embryos can actually help fix themselves if scientists jumpstart the process early enough. A study that shows uh, all you have to do is induce this self-repair and tell embryos where this damage is. And the rest of them actually done by, by, by embryos themselves. So I've been joking that we did very little ourselves. The process is still only laboratory research, but suggests that scientists could alter DNA to protect babies from inherited diseases. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Sheriff Richard Adair was the first man on the scene. A 19-year-old girl had been badly hurt after she was hit head-on by a drunk driver. And when Sheriff Adair approached her mangled car, what he saw that day changed his life. Traffic was stopped and I actually drove right up to the remains of this green Mercedes. And it was on its side with the roof facing me as I pulled up. On August 4th, 2013, Deputy Richard Adair of the Rawls County Sheriff's Department in Missouri responded to an accident involving two cars in a head-on collision. It was obvious that this was a really bad accident. It wouldn't be surprising if it was a fatal. 
The girl, the driver, Katie, all I could see was the top of her head and one hand that was sticking out. I actually held her hand and talked to her and tried to calm her. But none of his training or 30 years of experience prepared him for what came next. She said she wanted to pray out loud. And then I became mortified. <laughs> Richard had grown up in church, but to him, prayer was just an empty ritual to a faraway, uncaring God. I didn't know how to pray out loud. I knew, you know, the Our Father, I knew the Hail Mary. I didn't know how to pray out loud. That, for me personally, was mortifying. Curtis White, the gentleman there, I asked, can you pray with her? Yes, no problem. And he took her hand, and I made the excuse to go check the other driver of the other vehicle. The other driver suffered minor injuries, but had been drinking and charged with a DUI. As for Katie, it took fire crews two hours to safely cut her out of the tangled wreckage and put her on a chopper to the nearest trauma unit. Meanwhile, Richard couldn't stop thinking about the young woman who, despite being in excruciating pain and holding on to life, continued asking people to pray. Katie never screamed. She never cried out loud. She never cursed. She never was angry. All she did was pray out loud. And I just couldn't believe that as, as a 50-some-year-old man, how that young girl had that much faith in God. And I didn't. That's because over the past year, Richard had been trying to come to terms with the disappointments and failures in his own life and was searching for meaning and purpose. You know, I wanted to go to church. I guess I was looking for something that was missing. Then later, Richard and his wife Debbie visited Katie and her family at Blessing Hospital in Quincy, Illinois. I looked at my wife and I said, I can't believe how happy everybody is. Like, it's almost like we're at a birthday party. And her mother looked at me and said, we, we could be planning a funeral right now, and Katie's alive. And because of God's grace, Katie's alive. Finally, Richard understood what he had been struggling with. I was missing a relationship with God. I had no relationship with God. Soon afterwards, Richard and Debbie went to a local church service. I knew the first time I was there, we were talking about God and Jesus, and it just, it clicked. I, I don't know how to explain it. It just, I knew at that moment, it was like someone opening your eyes for the first time. In the coming months, Richard started reading the Bible and praying. As he did, he came to understand and accept God's love and forgiveness. During that time, he committed his life to Jesus Christ. I realized that I had to become right with, with God and correct things. I had to let, let go of anger that I held against others and just let it go. It's not, not for me to judge. It's over. Release that. Let it go. As he grew in his relationship with God, the people he felt he needed to share his new faith with the most were his children. I'd never even talked to my own children about God. I mean, they went to parochial schools. They, you know, did all the sacraments that our religion had you do, things I failed to teach them. And that was hard. It's, I mean, <sighs> it's not easy going to your children, your grown children, and saying, hey, I messed up. I didn't know God and didn't know how to show you who God was. As Richard lived out his faith, Debbie and his children also made a commitment to Jesus Christ. Here I am, a 53-year-old man who's 30 years as a cop, and I'm filling up because it's emotional, and it is. It's, it's, um, it's hard to explain. It's, sometimes it's hard to put into words. God used Katie that day in her suffering. And it's all because of a young woman, a stranger, who had the faith to pray. It's a simple prayer is just talking to God and having that relationship to be able to do that. Now, Richard thought that God was distant and uncaring, and he 
He's not. He is with you. He knows you. The Bible says he has carved your name in the palm of his hand. It says that he loves you with an everlasting love, that he will never leave you or forsake you. And yet, God, the creator of the universe, waits. He waits for you and I, for Richard and you and I, to come to the end of ourselves. And, you know, so often when we deal with God, we come to him with our perspective. And as we talk to him, we say, but God, this person did this, but God, that was unfair, but God, I don't have this. You know, there is such freedom when we drop the but gods and we just let God be who he is. When we come to him with the simplicity of a little child, not dragging our past with us, not making excuses, not giving a, a whole lineup of all the things that we've done or the places that we've failed or what others have done to us. We just come. You know, I, over the years, remember watching Billy Graham and listening to that song as people came down out of the, the stadium to the front to commit their lives as Christ, to Christ, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. That's what God's waiting for, for you to be done being God, making wrong choices, hauling your mess with you. Just come and say, God, I'm, I'm here naked before you in my failures, in my shortcomings, in my inabilities. I'm, I'm coming and I'm bowing down to you and I'm saying, you are God and I am not and I don't want to be anymore. Jesus, you died and it wasn't just a story. It's not just in a book that sits in our library. You're real and you died for me. And today I am saying I'm a sinner in need of that sacrifice, Jesus, in need of you and what you did. Forgive my sins, not something as generic as just the sins of the world, but my sins. I am so sorry. Listen, recognize today, you can't earn your way to heaven. There's nothing you can do to make you good enough. It doesn't work that way. The Bible says this, there is no name under, no other name under heaven by which men may be saved. The name is Jesus. Today, if you're empty, if your life has been falling apart, if you're ready to give up, don't do that. Call upon the name of Jesus. Humbly come to him, receive forgiveness. There's nothing you've done that can separate you from his love except to refuse to receive it. So confess your sins, receive his forgiveness, ask him for a new beginning. It's what Richard said, it's a conversation. He's your friend, he's your creator. He knows you pretty well, inside and out. So today, come to him. If you have a specific need in your life and you'd like someone to pray with you about it, our number's toll free and there are friends waiting by to talk to you right now. There's the number, 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, would you pray with me? You don't even have to tell us who you are. But today, do business with God. He's been waiting for you for a long time. He's faithful, he's true, and he's available to anyone who calls upon his name. By the way, if you prayed that prayer, we've got a great packet for you. It's called A New Day. How do you learn to walk with God in the everydayness of your life? This is our free gift to you when you call that toll-free number, so call now. Well, coming up next, time for another round of Ask Pat. Linda says, is it wrong to go to the casino every once in a while if we're just playing the penny machines? We're gonna answer that question and more when we come back. We're gonna take some time to ask Pat some of the email questions that you've sent in and Pat, this first one comes from Linda who says, is it wrong to go to the casino once in a while? I know other couples take dance lessons, they drink socially, et cetera, but we don't. We just play the penny machines and stay to ourselves. Just need some guidance here. All right, look, uh, I don't see anything wrong with uh, going to the casino uh, as such, but look, keep in mind, that gambling is a terrible addiction and the people who are hooked on it, are, they're destroying their lives. And the whole thing that's wrong with gambling is you're tempting God. You're saying, I'm putting $1,000 on the line that I'll pull to an inside straight or I'll get a flush or I can get another uh, ace or whatever, or I'm going to pull that handle and it'll come down. If all you're doing is you've got 
couple of bucks and you just want to have some fun, I don't see anything wrong with it. But keep in mind your your example might what it'll do to somebody else. Mm -hmm. But you ask, is it wrong to go to the casino? But once you begin to get hooked on gambling and you begin to think it's a way of making money, then you're in serious trouble. That's the problem, okay? Okay, this is Roxanne who says, there's a company in Wisconsin that is microchipping their employees. Is this the start of the cashless society? Shouldn't we get the word out that this is not a good thing and not to take it? Your thoughts, please. Um, well, you know, the Bible says the time will come, the so-called antichrist and the false prophet that uh, everybody will have a mark on their hand or on their forehead, and uh, they can't buy or sell without that mark. And, you know, we have now tattoos and so forth and microchips that you can put in that have all your medical record, all your financial record, everything about you. And uh, I, I think it's not a good thing. You know, we look at Big Brother will control society. How does he do it? That's one way it will be done. I don't think it's a good thing. I wouldn't want a company with sticking something in my hand that says everything about me, all my medical records. All you got to do is go through a scanner. But uh, they think, well, it's convenient. Of course it's convenient. But uh, I, I, th I like having cash. I, I think the idea that there's some big computer can wipe out your wealth. I mean, that there's some serious things happening in our society. And uh, this tendency it's always, let's do it so much easier. Everything's more convenient. Easier, you know. faster, right. Faster, more convenient, but you can give up a lot of your liberty. Okay. okay. This is Robert, who says, My wife of 41 years passed this last January. During the last five years of her life, her sister was staying with us to help care for her. The two of us have grown closer since my wife's passing. We've been together now for several months and have decided to marry. My question is this, are we committing some moral sin in God's eyes, breaking any biblical laws? Will we burn in hell for all eternity? <laughs> and am I disrespecting my deceased wife? Wow. I think your deceased wife would be thrilled that her husband she loves has found happiness. She's dead. She's going to be with Jesus. She's having the joy with the angels. So why should she want you to live single and be miserable? Um, there's, once your spouse dies, you are free to get remarried under any interpretation of the Bible. And if you found a mate, obviously her sister reminds you of her. I, I think what you're doing is saying, I love my wife so much, and her sister is kind of like a mirror image. But if you found a soulmate that you can finish out the last years of your life, by all means, do it. Okay, this is Elizabeth who says, how do the Ten Commandments affect born-again Christians? Were they only written for the Jewish people? What do I say to Seventh-day Adventists who insist that we should keep the Sabbath on Saturday? Well, oh, the principle, I, I wrote a book about the Ten Commandments, and they do have eternal values for us today. But what is the value? You know, remember the Sabbath and keep it mm -hmm. holy. Of course, on six days, God labored. On the seventh, he rested, and therefore we honor him. The whole principle of that is that you would have a day of rest, one out of seven, that you wouldn't work, that you would be able to have recreation, that you could have a day to worship him, and so forth. That's what it's all about. You know, the uh, Muslims, what I'm, I'm trying to think, who's got Friday? The, the Muslims, <laughs> Muslims have Friday, Everybody's the Jews Sunday, have Saturday, yeah. the Christians, Christians have, have Sunday. Sunday. And uh, it's a question of you take one day out of the week. Can you imagine what it would be like if you had to work seven days a week and the next seven and another seven and another seven? You'd go out of your mind. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. But the principles about honoring your parents, about not stealing, about protecting people's uh, reputations, don't bear false witness. It's all in there, and it's all important. Uh, absolutely, it, this is timeless for everybody. Okay, this is Deborah who says, Would God ever tell a man who has become wealthy at the expense of his wife and five children to leave all his money to ministries, to neglect his sick wife and force her to live in filth with no water half the time, and to lie to her, telling her there is no money? My dad is doing this to my mother so he can leave his millions to ministries. I don't believe God would tell a man this. He watches your show all the time. <clears throat> I do wish you'd address this. Well, the Bible says if a man will not look after his own, he's worse than an unbeliever. And you, he's worse than an infidel. I mean, you have to look after your own family, your own children, your own wife. 
you can't put them in poverty and say, well, I'm giving to God. You remember Jesus talking about the ones who said, well, what's supposed to be yours is Corbin that is, is given in a pledge, and therefore you, you, you frustrate the Word of God? Uh, by all means, give to ministries, but don't neglect your loved ones who are your primary responsibility. Well, we'll leave you with these words from 2 Corinthians. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. For Terry and all of us, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.